Hi, this is Theory Station, and I'm John Duggan. This program is the Rational Choice Modeling Program. The series that we're on is the Basic Formal Theory Toolkit, and this is installment six in the series. Um, so recently, I've been talking about um, the one-dimensional policy choice model. Um, we pushed that a little bit to add a feasible set, and then we endogenized the feasible set by adding a voter. and um, you know, that's still pretty abstract because there's only one voter. Suppose that um, there were more than one voter, uh, and um, so to be approved, a policy would take a majority of the vote, let's say. Um, how would the model change then? Um, to be a little more concrete, maybe think about there being a, a committee. So there's an executive that makes a proposal, and then there's a vote in a committee about whether to accept this or not. Um, so we are then looking at the one-dimensional policy choice model um, with multiple voters. All right, so a lot of this stays the same. If I set this up formally, we have this policy space. We have a politician with an ideal point. Um, the politician prefers uh, policies closer to their ideal point. Uh, we have a, well, I was about to say we have a voter, but now um, we actually have, let's say there's uh, N voters. Um, and um, just to keep things simple, um, I'm just going to number them. I won't bother giving them all names. So the voters are numbered 1 through n, and some natural number. Um, again, in the spirit of keeping things simple, let's assume that um, n is an odd number. Um, you know, in rational choice modeling of politics, um, a lot of times it can be simpler to assume an odd number of voters or sometimes an even number, depending. Um, not much rides on it, but uh, it's just going to make uh, the presentation simpler. So an odd number of voters. So um, I'm going to use uh, something called an index. It's basically just a variable that runs through the, the natural numbers 1 to n, okay? And um, so I'll use i for that index. Maybe sometimes I'll use j as well, but I think i'll be good enough. And um, so we're going to assume that each voter has Euclidean preferences, meaning um, that each voter I has an ideal point all right we'll denote that V with a subscript I of course P is the ideal point of the politician and um, let's assume that uh, that these are distinct that's really for simplicity um, so each voter has some unique ideal point that's different from the other voters. And um, given that, well, it's really without loss of generality to assume that um, voter one is the leftmost voter, voter two is the you know, next person to the right, and so on. Um, it's without loss of generality because if the ordering were different, we could just, um, you know, assign the numbers to the voters differently. We can just rearrange the voters. Um, so basically, I'm going to put the ideal points in order and then number the voters so that the ideal points are increasing uh, in the index of the voter. All right, so, and then we still need a status quo. So, you know, you can see things are getting more complex. Um, should just make it clear one more time 
Um, so I'm thinking about a model where the politician makes a policy choice, P, and this committee of voters then it takes a vote. Um, for the sake of argument, let's assume that it's um, simultaneous. You can even say it's um, you know by secret ballot. It doesn't really matter. Each voter looks at the proposed policy, compares that to the status quo, and um, let's just assume. Again, you can get all of this from more a deeper game theoretic analysis. But for now, let's just assume that each voter votes for the policy proposal if it's closer to their ideal point than the status quo. If the policy proposal is further than the status quo, then they reject it. Um, and if a voter is indifferent, so suppose that the, um, the policy proposal and the status quo are the same distance from the voter. Um, again, to keep things simple, let's just assume the voter accepts the proposal. Okay, so again, we're going to impose the optimality principle here. Uh, and, and in particular from the point of view of the politician, when they're considering different policy proposals, they have to anticipate uh, which proposals will be accepted by a majority of the committee and, and which ones will be rejected. So, um, so the politician has to think ahead about what happens um, as a function of their proposal. So let's just draw a um, picture of this policy space. And um, we'll put the, let's keep the politician over here, status quo is over here. Um, so the way I want to um, think about this is, um, let's suppose the politician chooses X. Uh, will that pass or not? Well, we can't say anything yet because I haven't put the voters in this picture. Um, before I do that, though, let's um, let me look at the midpoint between the status quo and this policy proposal. That doesn't look like it's exactly in the middle. Let's do better. Uh, that's a little closer. All right, so that midpoint, that's just x plus q over 2. All right. Now, um, Let's suppose that you are a voter who is to the left of that midpoint. Suppose you're here, VI, your voter I. Um, well, clearly the status quo is closer to your ideal point than the proposal. So um, you're going to vote for the status quo. Suppose a voter is, well, let's take a different voter, voter J. Suppose you are to the right of that midpoint. Well, that means now that the status, uh, the status quo is further from you than the policy proposal. You're closer to X than you are to the status quo. So, um, so what we see is that any voter to the left of that midpoint, these guys are going to vote for the status quo. Any voter to the right of that midpoint is going to, going to vote for the policy proposal. Um, all right, so again, you need uh, this politician needs a majority of the committee uh, to approve in order to get this proposal passed. Let me just let's flip up here. Okay, so we have our voters, one to n. Let me um, let me single out a particular voter. Um, voter n plus one over two. Okay, remember n is odd, so n plus one is even. So if I divide by two, that's an integer. This voter here is um, you know that's that's a well-defined voter, and remember that um, we're assuming that the ideal points of the voters are in order of the indexes. All right, 
So um, if I look at this voter n plus 1 over 2, their ideal point is in the middle of the distribution of voter ideal points. Okay. Um, so what that means is that um, if I look at voter n plus 1 over 2 and everyone to the left, that's a majority. Okay, because it has n plus 1 over 2 voters. Suppose I look at voter n plus 1 over 2 and everyone to the right. That is also a majority because it contains n plus 1 over 2 voters. So you can sort of tell that this guy who's in the middle of the distribution of preferences is going to be pivotal in some sense. Um, and he is in this kind of model. Uh, the term that we use for this voter is we call them a median voter. And um, it turns out that this guy is going to be pivotal in deciding whether a policy proposal is approved or not. So to see this, let's go back to our picture of the policy space that we just had. Suppose that status quo is here. Suppose there's a policy proposal X. And now there's this midpoint, which is um, it's X plus Q uh, over 2. All right, so is that policy going to pass or not? Well, the voters' ideal points are in here in some, you know, some arrangement. Um, but I'm going to focus on this median voter, okay? Suppose the median voter is here. Okay, in that case, the median voter is to the left of the midpoint. That means they're going to uh, vote for the status quo. Now, remember, if we look at the median voter and everyone to the left, that is a majority. But that means in this case, we have at least n plus 1 over 2 people to the left of this midpoint. They're all going to vote for the status quo. So that means that the status quo will get a majority and the proposal fails. Proposal is rejected. What about the case where the median voter is to the right of that cut point or that midpoint? Well, if we look at that median voter and everyone to the right, that's a majority. Um, so that means there's a majority of voters. In this case, there's a majority of voters to the right of the midpoint. They're all going to vote for the proposed policy. And so the proposal is approved. So you can see the outcome of the vote just depends on the um, location of the median voter relative to this midpoint. I should say, if the median voter is exactly at the midpoint, that means that they're indifferent between the two. And um, we're just assuming in that case, to keep things simple, that, they, that the median voter approves. And, and then the proposal will actually be approved. All right, so everything boils down to this median voter. Okay, so let's just um, complete the analysis then. Um, so I'm going to put in the status quo. Here's the politician. And now, you know, there's n voters here, and it can be a big number. It can be an entire legislature if you, if you want. Um, but or it could be a referendum, it could be an entire electorate who are voting. But I'm only going to put in the ideal point of the median voter. And, um, and then we're going to think about the optimal policy choice, or optimal policy proposal. So suppose the politician chooses, well, okay, so let me, let me look at, um, I'm going to take this difference between the median voter and the status quo, and I'm just going to shift that to the right. And then I'm going to have an interval, and this endpoint is going to be okay. 
it's just the same formula as before, but now we're using the median voters um, ideal point. So if we look at this interval, suppose a policy proposal inside the interval is made. All right, so this x that I've chosen here, or any x in that interval, is going to be closer to the median voter than the status quo. So the median voter will vote for that proposal. We've just seen that the median voter is pivotal. That means, in fact, a majority of, of voters will go also for the proposal. And, um, and so the proposal will pass. Um, what if a proposal outside that interval is made? Well, now um, that's further from the status quo uh, sorry, further from the median voter than the status quo, the median voter will vote to reject because the median voter is pivotal. We know a majority of voters have the same preference. They're also going to reject. And so these are going to be rejected. So if you are the this politician, what is your optimal proposal? Well, if you propose anything over here, that's going to get rejected. So the best thing that you can do is propose the right-hand endpoint of that acceptance interval. In fact, it's the same solution as in the previous installment where we had a single voter. Um, the only difference now is that we're focusing, now we have a, a bunch of voters, but we're just isolating this median voter who turns out to be pivotal. So it's not always true that, you know, models with multiple voters can be reduced to models of a single voter. Things get pretty interesting and, um, you know, and very rich and more general models. But in this model, with this kind of structure, assuming Euclidean preferences, in fact, we can extend the model to multiple voters um, and we can still, you know, directly solve for this optimal proposal. Um, you can see that as we're building on this model, it's becoming more interesting. It started off pretty boring, um, but we're getting to more substantial models of politics. Um, in the next installment, I'm, I'm going to stick with this model a little bit more because it really is, um, it's just one of the most important models in politics. Um, and I'm going to ask what about the status quo? Where did that come from? Um, can we think about, can, you know, can we extend this model even further and think about where that came from? Uh, so we're going to endogenize the status quo. So that's what's coming up next.